so we read before the prayer in Luke 17. This is a, this is a scripture that we've looked at in the, the opening parts of this series. I don't know if I'm on part three or four, but nonetheless, I know we've looked at this in, e in each case. And I want to go back and reiterate just a couple of things because what's going to happen here in this, in this context is Jesus is going to address forgiveness, which is the topic of this series study. And, and what really sets us up to understand forgiveness and its importance is this thing about offense. So Jesus says here in verse number one, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. Would you just read that part out loud? It is impossible, but that offenses will come. Church, that's so important we understand that. Married folk, you need this. I'm married, I need this. Married folk need a word on offense, amen. All folk need a word on offense because offense is something that Jesus said here is, is, is something that we'll always be vulnerable to. It's impossible if you think offenses are not coming. Well, what is offense? Offense is based on expectation. It, when my expectations are not met in another, that's when offense sets in. There are two types of offended people. Those that have been wronged are those that think they have been wronged. But either way, that's what leads to offense. Offense, by definition, is a trap. It actually comes from the word scandalon, where we get the word scandal, and it, and it refers to a baited trap, a baited trap. So when we get offended, by definition, we are trapped. And that's why it's so important that we learn how to work through and to overcome offenses because offense can handicap you right where you are. It can handicap a marriage. It can handicap a relationship. It handicaps us. We get stuck wherever we get offended. And I feel like we've been programmed to just, you know, when it comes to offenses, we, we, we fight or flight. And something that I want to reiterate that I said last week that I'm really hoping parents will hear me when I say this Let's not raise our children to leave when they get offended. We have to learn how to work through offense because Jesus said it's impossible if you think offenses are not coming. They're a part of life. You're either going to be offended by somebody or you're likely going to offend someone or somebody's going to bring you an offense that they have toward another. But when Jesus said that offense, free living is an impossibility then we need to know, okay, how do I prepare for being offended? And then let me inject this. In Matthew 24, verse 10, Jesus lists these signs of the last days. He lists war, nation rising against nation or ethnic group against ethnic group. He lists pestilence, disease, viruses, incurable disease. He lists famine. He lists earthquakes. And then in verse 10, he said, in those days, Many will be offended. Many will be offended. And as a result of that offense in Matthew 24, 10, he goes on to say that they will betray one another and hate one another. I think for most of us as believers that have read the word and had some knowledge of the word, when we think about the last days, when we think about the end of time as we know it, we probably have our own, you know, populated list of things that we point to and say, man, this is a... This is a, a, a sign of the last days, but I don't know how many of us have ever looked at offense as being a sign of the last days, but Jesus in Matthew 24, 10 says that offense will be a sign of the last days. And I'm telling you right now, you can't step out into this world we're living in. I, I got off social media on May 4th. The Lord called me off of it, and I've not been on it, but I know if I was on it, I would see offense. Right now, it's just like the whole world, the culture of the world is just setting on the edge of offense, and people are mad at each other and bitter at each other and hateful and divided like we've probably never seen in our lifetime. So how do we as believers uh, respond to offense whether it's our spouse that's offended at us or we're offended at our spouse or a brother or someone in our family or a church or business or when we're seeing it like we are right now in the community, how do we respond to offense? 
Church, what I'm reading to you is the words of Jesus. I'm gonna stick to the scripture. If you get offended at what I'm saying, I'm not even saying it. I'm just gonna read what Jesus says right here because in response to the reality of offense, he gives this word, he gives this counsel. This is Jesus, the all-wise counselor, saying this is how you respond. And there's something I want us to see in verse three and then we're going to move on because I know we've covered this quite a bit. I want you to take your eyes and look at verse 3. I want you to see Luke 17, verse 3. And for a moment, I want you to ignore the first statement in that verse and pick up with the words, if thy brother. All right? So what we're going to do for a minute is we're going to pretend that this verse begins with, if thy brother. All right? So let's read it that way. Ready? Read. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. Now, most of us wouldn't have any problem with that. I, I, I can handle that. I get to rebuke somebody. Yes, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. The Lord told me to rebuke you. So, most of us, you know, we, we can handle verse 3. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. Go to him. Tell him what he did wrong. Tell him why he's wrong. And, and deal with it. And if he'll repent and own it, then you forgive and let's move on and, 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 and restore the relationship. But what I want us to see, and I think it's so important that we see, is that Jesus did not say that alone. The verse does not begin with, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. The verse begins with, read it, take heed to yourselves. Read that again. Take heed to yourselves. Now, this might save somebody's marriage if you'll pay attention to what Jesus said right here. Before he said, go to your brother, your neighbor, whoever it was that offended you. Before he says, you go to him and rebuke him for what he's done, he said first in verse 3, read it again, take heed to yourselves. What does that mean? That means before I go to anybody that's wronged me, before I go to anybody that has offended me, I first am going to take a look at me. I'm going to begin with me. Jesus says, before you address your neighbor, address yourself. The Word tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 that if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. As a matter of fact, when Jesus deals with judging one another, he says this in Matthew 7, 3. He, he says, before you go to remove a moat that might be in your brother's eye, first get the beam out of yours. Now, if you don't understand moat and beam, let me translate. Jesus is saying, before you get the sawdust out of your brother's eye, make sure you get the telephone pole that's dangling out of yours. He's not saying that I shouldn't get the sawdust out of your eye. He's just saying, I better make sure my eyes are clear before I try to get that one out of your eye. Now, let me tell you what my testimony is in that verse right there. Marriage for me early on, and I think for my wife Anna, and we've been married for a minute now, but marriage early on was, hey, hey whoa, whoa, what, what, what's going on here? You can't say that. You can't do that. Why'd you say that? Why'd you do that? Why'd you say it that way? Sensitive. Sensitive was my middle name when I first got married. I not only paid attention to what my wife said, I paid attention to the way she said it. Y'all hear what I'm saying to you? I mean, you know how when you, when you fill out a banking a, a account or something or some kind of password online, it'll ask you security questions? Like, what is your favorite snack? Or who was in the name of your first grade teacher? That kind of stuff. I, I was doing a security question one time and it said, what is your pet peeve? I would have never written this before marriage. But because I was married, my pet peeve, I wrote on there, T-O-N-E, a tone. That's my pet peeve. I can't take it if you give me a tone. Why you had to give me a tone like that? See, married folk know what I'm talking about. If you're married, say amen. You know what I'm talking about. It's not just what you said. It's how you said it. So when I first got married, I was super sensitive, and so I was quick to jump on the thing that, that rubbed me the wrong way. But marriage taught me something. Life taught me something. 
what Jesus had been trying to tell me the whole time. Before I go to Chrissy and tell her what you just said or the way you said it offended me, I need to go feed the dogs. Not because the dogs are hungry, but I need to talk to Jesus. I need to go out by myself and think about what just happened. Did I provoke it? Have I contributed to it? Am I a part of the problem? Am I the problem? Jesus, could you help me to see clearly before I go in there and tell that woman how wicked her ways are? And I'm telling you, most of the time, if not all of the time, I get so convicted by what I did and how I contributed to it that when I did go back in the house, it, it wasn't even no dealing with an offense. It was a Lou Rawls moment where I'm telling her, baby, you'll never find. I mean, it turned into affection and me demonstrating the, the different languages of apologetics. Why? Because once I looked at me, it changed the way I would judge her. And so Jesus is saying, hey, before you criticize, before you condemn, before you rebuke your neighbor, first look in your own heart, look in your own life, see if you find anything that you've done wrong, is your heart not right with God, get you squared away, and then go deal with the other. If we did that, it would change the way we treated people. I read this once that there was this couple that would seat every morning in their breakfast table and they'd look out their windows and they would see the neighbor who had hung their, their sheets out to dry like they did back in the days when they used the clothesline. And so he would say to his wife, he said, man, they, we, need to we, need, we need to talk to them. Look at them dirty sheets. Look at them dirty sheets. Are they not adding bleach to the water? Look how dingy them sheets look. And day after day after day, the guy was just so disturbed that his neighbor did such a poor job of washing the sheets. So one day they sat down for coffee, and he looked out the window, and he said, baby, you ain't going to believe this. They finally put some bleach in the water. Look at them beautiful white sheets. The wife looked back, and she said, honey, that ain't their sheets. I cleaned our windows yesterday. Sometimes we're looking at other people, but it's our own view that's messed up. It's our own heart that's wrong. We're viewing other people in a light because our own light's not right. Jesus said, I'm not saying you can't go rebuke your brother. You might have to go rebuke your brother. If there's something that needs to be called out, then call it out. But before you do, begin with you. That's what Jesus is saying. Address your own heart. Address your own heart. Uh, uh, life before you judge another. Now, I want us to go to Matthew 18, and, 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 and I want to look at something that Jesus says about this in Matthew 18, but as you turn there, I, I, I want to just share something else, all right, because I, I'm loaded this morning. I got, I got a lot to get out and a little, little time to do. Now, when, when Jesus says here, deal with yourself first, judge yourself first before you go and, and deal with your brother and bring up your brother's issue. That, that's the wisest counsel that we could ever glean when it comes to offense and forgiveness is that, okay, Lord, I, I'm going I'm to begin by, by, by starting with me. Now, how many of you, whoo, Lord, how many of you, not you, did it, but you hurt somebody, would not go to church I would not receive Christ, I would not become a Christian because they said all Christians are, hip are hypocrites. How many of you ever heard that ever in your life? Christians are hypocrites. All right, how many of you ever said it? Ah, I see how you do. Let me tell you what the word hypocrite means. It, the, the word hypocrite is a compound word that, that's made up, the word, made up of the word hype and criticism. The word hypocrite means hypercritical, hypercritical. You ever heard of a hyper child? I'm a hyper preacher. A lot of energy, all right? So hyper means over the top, filled with passion, filled with zeal, uh, 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 fired up, hyper, hyper, hyper. I got all this energy, hyper. Hyper criticism is I am quick to jump on everybody else's mess. I'm all over everything everybody else has done, but I'm overlooking my own. And I'm telling you, when we're hypercritical, when we're ready to point at everybody and everything, but we never pointed ourselves. We misrepresent the kingdom of God. And we become, a, sadly, a legitimate excuse for people that won't enter into faith because all they see is Christians that are ready to point their finger at everybody but never willing to judge ourselves. And Jesus taught us when the woman was caught in adultery, adultery caught in the very act. I used to wonder why did they bring the woman 
If she was caught in the act of adultery, there had to have been a man. There must have been a big man because they only brought the woman. And they bring the woman before Jesus. And they said, we caught this woman in the very act of adultery. And, and they said, the law says stone her. And they looked at Jesus and they said, Jesus, what do you say? And Jesus looked back at her accusers. And he said, he, without sin among you, cast the first stone. All of them, when they had to look at themselves, realized, I'm not without sin. So who am I to condemn this woman? And they dropped their stones. Jesus then looked back at that woman and he said, where are your accusers? She said, I have none, Lord. And he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And she walked away having received the mercy of God. If we would judge ourselves first, the judgment that we have on our neighbor and our spouses and our brothers and our kinfolk and church folk and all other kind of folk would change if we would ever just begin with us. I know this is not a popular message, but it is what Jesus is teaching us. Now, let, let, me, let, me, let me put some weight on this by looking at something else Jesus said in Matthew 18. If you're there, say amen. Matthew 18. So Jesus, in Luke 17, is dealing with offense. And to deal with offense, he teaches the power of forgiveness. The power of forgiveness. If it were an easy word, the great apostles whose names are inscribed in heaven, who all saw Jesus face to face, if it were an easy word, the apostles would not have looked back at him in Luke 17 verse 5 and said, Lord, you got to increase our faith. You got to increase my faith if you want me to do this. I'm just being real. I need more faith if you want me to forgive a man seven times a day. We have not seen Jesus face to face. We, we are living in a faith of what Jesus did for us over 2,000 years ago. I believe this word. I believe he died for me, but I'm not an apostle. I don't have that special gift, and I have not seen Jesus. So if they needed an increase of faith, I need an increase of faith when it comes to what he's asking me to do. So if any of this is hard on you, then no, it was hard on the apostles too. But the only way that our faith is going to be increased is by hearing the word of God. Because Romans 10, 17 says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. So if I hear his word, my faith can be increased. My son asked me yesterday, driving down the road, because all, all everybody, our children that are old enough to have any understanding, see what's going on in the world. And our world is just filled with so much evil right now. My son asked me, basically, I'm paraphrasing, Daddy, how do you get in the pulpit? How do you minister to so many different people, thousands of people, and, and, and be able to teach and preach the word without people being offended? And my words to him was, son, I cannot take my opinion or my thoughts to that platform. I have to get up and speak the word and stay true to the word. That way, as long as you're a believer in the word, you can receive what Jesus is saying. And if you get offended, you're not offended at me because I'm just showing you what Jesus said. I said, but you have to take yourself out of the equation. Folk don't need somebody's opinion. And, and I don't think anybody wants a pulpit to be used as a soapbox. What we need is truth. Truth will make us free. And so this truth is not always easy, but it is all always liberating hallelujah because his word will not return unto him void now watch this in Matthew 18 Peter's still struggling remember it was the apostles that said Lord increase our faith and it may have been Peter that was their spokesman and the only reason I say that is because Peter's always outspoken he's always one the first one to speak up sometimes that was good sometimes that was bad Watch verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? Well, Jesus taught seven times. We just read it in Luke 17. But Jesus noticed, like I showed you last week, Jesus noticed, oh, you, you, you're keeping account. You're trying to put an expiration date on forgiveness. So Jesus said back in verse 22, I said not unto thee, I say not unto thee seven times, I'm going to say until 70 times seven. That's 490 times. The point here is, is Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you a number you can't keep up with. In a day. In a day. Now, watch what he goes on to do in verse 23. 
Somebody please tell me what that first word is. Therefore. And word of God, folk, anytime we read the word therefore, we know it is therefore a reason. What is the therefore? Therefore. The therefore connects the, the coming statement to the one that came before it. A therefore connects the following statement with the one that came before it. Therefore is connecting what he just said to what he's about to say. All right? So he says, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. Now that might not amount to a, a hill of 10 beans. But if you're one that writes in your Bible, let me give you the translation. 10,000 talents is $10 million. Now, I, you got my attention, Lord. I understand that. The man owed you $10 million. That was the debt. But he couldn't pay the debt. And the Lord commanded that, he be, that the debt be paid, and he couldn't pay the debt. So he begged of his Lord in verse 26, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant, verse 27, was moved with compassion and loosed him, read the rest, and forgave him the debt. Read it again. And forgave him the debt. Forgave a $10 million debt. That's a debt to be forgiven right there. Now, the same servant went out in verse 28 and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. A hundred pence amounts to about $20. $20. All right? And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat. If anybody in here has ever grabbed a man by the throat for $20, would you raise your hand? Just kidding. <laughs> well, I think there might be one or two of y'all say, yeah, I did it. Grabbed a man by the throat for $20 and said, you better pay me my money, dude. Now watch this. His fellow servants in verse 31 felt sorry for the man. And they said, how is it? that you were forgiven $10 million, but you wouldn't forgive another man $20. When you think about what you've been forgiven, why couldn't you be forgiving? And so when the Lord found out about it, verse 27, uh, 34, verse 34, he, when he, his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Now read verse 35 out loud. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. So God is saying here in his word, if you won't forgive your brother their trespass, I'm not going to forgive you of your trespass. And the, in, the, in the parable, Jesus is comparing a man that was forgiven $10 million, but yet would not forgive a $20 debt. Now, I don't know about you, but me, myself, and I, all three of us, we could not pay a $10 million debt. But the point here is sin. The point here is sin. Let me bring this all home, please. Romans 3.23 says the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. That means the debt that I owe God for my sin is death, if I believe the Bible, and I believe the Bible. From the very beginning, when, when, when God created man and he gave man the first commandment, the, 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 the payment for breaking that commandment would be death. When he told Adam, if you eat of this tree that I'm telling you not to eat of, a tree that would make you as God, a tree that would, that would lead you to believe that you could determine what is good and what is evil, a tree that is Satan is still tempting people to eat of today. He said, if you eat of this tree, you will surely die. Death would be the penalty for breaking God's commandment. Romans 6, uh, 6, 23, I misquoted that. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. So if I want to sin against God, what I owe him is death. That's how I pay it. Many folk don't understand this, that, that the penalty for sin was death. That's why God had to send his son to die for my sin because the penalty was death. When Adam sinned against God, 
and in his conscience was convicted, and he and Eve are hiding from God, God showed up in that garden, and his first recorded words after man's sin reveal his heart. Because his first recorded words were, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? You know as well as I do there are folk that will run from folk when they owe folk money. You loan brother law thirty dollars and he don't show up for another family gatherings. And you're like, well, hey, where's so and so? Oh man, he had to work today. He ain't at work. He just knows he owes you some money. Now, if you don't know, if you don't, if that's not happening to you, it's happening to somebody you know. Adam got caught in a debt he couldn't pay, and so he's running from God. He's running from God because of that debt of of, of, of sin. But God revealed his heart. Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? I want the relationship. I want reconciliation. I still want to walk with you. I still want to be able to be your father. I still want my will to be done in your life. But that offense, that offense, that sin that Adam committed had him hiding from God and running from God. God is a just God. But God is equally a merciful God. Hallelujah. And there are times in our life when we go before the Lord and we say, Lord, please show justice. Have justice. Let justice prevail. We say that. We ask for that until we're the ones that are guilty. Because if I were guilty before God after sinning against him, I would not say, God, Show your hand of justice. No, if it's me in the sin against God, I'm like, have mercy on me. Am I right about it? I got two of y'all clapping. Who, who in the world would go before God in sin and say, Lord, demonstrate your justice? No, it's then I ask for mercy. Let me finish this point. Because Adam, if God has justice, dies. God will never compromise justice to show mercy, but he will never compromise mercy to show justice. You say, how could God be this way? I'm gonna show you. So he goes before Adam, and he calls Adam out, and Adam comes forward, and what does he do? In Genesis 3.21, he sacrifices a lamb. He sacrifices a lamb. Death had never taken place on the planet, but now this innocent animal has died. He takes the skin of that animal and he clothes Adam. He covers Adam. Adam now, what had him hiding from God, what had him running from God, is now able to walk with God because the debt was paid. Paid by who? Paid by God. God was demonstrating in that garden that day with the first man that ever sinned that I will pay your debt. I am a just God. I require the payment of sin to be made. That's why he sent Jesus into this earth. He sent Jesus into this earth to die for my sin, to pay my $10 million debt, to pay a debt I could have never paid in my life. I couldn't pay this debt of sin with tithes. I couldn't pay this debt of sin with church attendance. I couldn't pay this debt of sin with wearing a suit and going to church and calling myself a Christian. I could not pay this debt with a praise offering or worship. No, there's nothing I can do in my life to pay this debt sin. The wages of sin is death. That means if you want to pay your sin debt, there's only one way to pay it, by death. That means sin is a debt I cannot pay. It might as well be a $10 million mortgage. I can't pay it. And what does God do? He pays it for me. He pays it for me. And what does man do? We receive a debt of death paid. And we'll hold all against folk for 20 years over $20. And I'm not saying there's not bigger issues. I'm just saying Christians, Christians, I can't deal with the world. The world is going to be lost until he gets saved. And the people of the world are going to do what the prince of this world is leading them to do. Because I believe in the prince and power of the air. And I believe in spiritual warfare, according to Ephesians 6. And I believe in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that the little G-God, Satan, is the God of this world. And he blinds minds and he keeps people in darkness unless the light of the glorious gospel should shine into them. I can't help what the world is doing. They are divided. They are offended. They are hateful. They're, they're killing folk and murdering folk and have no regard for life. I can't 
helped the world. But body of Christ, I'm talking to you. Born again believers that name Jesus, I'm talking to you. If we're going to bear the name of Jesus, if we're going to say God has forgiven us, then we better walk in love toward our neighbor. Folk that look like us, folk that don't look like us, folk that we go to school with, folk we did not go to school with, rich, poor, black, white, everything in between. If we are going to live out our faith, we have to walk in a love for all men. Biblically, that's what God's called us to do. I can't help the world. They're going to hate me. They're going to hate you. Jesus said they would. But as a believer in Jesus Christ who has received forgiveness, my, my call in life is to love my neighbor like myself. Is that easy to do? No. If it were easy, the, the apostles wouldn't have said, Lord, increase our faith. <clears throat> Man. Glory to God. Let's go to Acts. Chapter 26, offense and unforgiveness will handicap our life. It will handicap our life. It will keep us stuck wherever we were when that thing entered. And I got to say this to you. It's going to get heavy and I'm going to be done here in a minute. Satan is an accuser of the brethren. I didn't make that up. That's Revelation 12, 10. Satan is an accuser of the brethren. Y'all need to hear this. I need to hear this. Because there are things that are taking place in our heart and in our lives that we may not have been able to understand that I hope this brings light to. Satan is an accuser of the brethren. I looked up that word accuser just to see what it meant. In the original language, what, what does the word accuser even mean? And I found that it comes from the Greek word kategoros, and it means plaintiff, plaintiff. Here's the definition. The accuser of the brethren, that word accuser means to be a plaintiff or to charge with an offense. Ooh, we're getting somewhere now. Satan, according to Revelation 12, 10, is a plaintiff that accuses of an offense. What does this mean? This means Satan needs the offense. Satan points to the offense. The offense is his leverage. Why? Offense is what separates. Offense is what separates man from God. Offense is what separates man from man. Folk have left relationships over offense. Moved to other cities over offense. Stayed away from parents over offense. Won't talk to their brother in eight years over an offense. Left the church over an offense. Left the school over an offense. Think about how offenses wedge, uh, uh, perform, become a wedge between people. Offenses divide. And the word tells us that Satan divides in order to destroy. So if he wants to destroy a family, he tries to divide it. If he wants to destroy a church, he tries to divide it. If he wants to destroy a nation, then all he has to do is divide it. And what is the dividing wedge? Offense. So Satan is the accuser. And I'm, I'm going to show you how this works in our own lives. Because it's happened to me. I know it's had to happen to you. You, you, you did what you knew you, you shouldn't have done. And you go to pray. And the voice says, what are you doing? Who are you to pray? Or maybe you, you, you become a minister of the gospel and you're preaching the word. But your past ain't that far back there. And you go to share the word with somebody and that spirit says, what are you doing? Who are you to preach? Who are you to share the word after what you did? Or you go to church, and the devil says, you're going to go to church after what you did last night? What's the enemy doing? He's accusing you. He's accusing you. Let me magnify the offense. Let me magnify the offense. Why does he want to magnify the offense? He's trying to separate you from God. He's trying to separate us from a walk with God. He's trying to keep you out of prayer, keep you out of the word, keep you from preaching Jesus, keep you from loving people. So he's the magnifier of the offense. Why? Because he wants to form a wedge. I was reading the other day, and man, this hit me. It, I was reading Psalm 89, 14. I know you're in Acts 26. I'm going to get on over here so you can prove to you I'm, I'm actually going there. I was reading this the other day. It was, it was Psalm 89, 14. And it says, justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Oh, this is so important. This is so important. God's throne 
where he sits in authority. His throne, it, the Bible says the habitation of that throne is justice. Justice. He's a God of justice. And I know there are people that look at wrongs, innocent people being wronged. I want you to know that this God is a God of justice. Hallelujah. There may be injustice in the land. There may be injustice in the courtroom of a man. But there will never be injustice before our God. He is a God of justice and his habitation is just. Now, that's good when I'm innocent. But it ain't so good when I'm not. And I was reading that, and I heard the Holy Spirit. I heard the Holy Spirit as clear as I'm talking to you right now. And he said this, his, his habitation may be justice, but his seat is mercy. His seat is mercy. His seat is mercy. Another thing I didn't make up, Exodus 25, verse 22, when God called Moses to build the tabernacle and the seven furnishings of the tabernacle in the holy place where the Shekinah glory of God would, would inhabit, he said, make me a seat, overlay it with pure gold, and I will sit there. And he said, call that seat the mercy seat. That means God's habitation may be justice, but in the midst of justice, he is still seated in mercy. When you are seated, that's your position. All of you right now that are seated in this sanctuary, your position is based on how you are seated. If the seat were a stool, you'd be positioned differently. If the seat were a bing bag, you'd be seated differently. Your position is based on your seat. God is seated in mercy. What does that mean? He's always in the position to show mercy even when the environment is justice. He is, uh, he is seated in, the, in mercy. That is such good news for me. That when I could go before God who is just, whose throne room is just, that I could walk before a just God and him still have the position of mercy. That's a good God. He's positioned in it. These two blind men were by the highway side. And Jesus was walking down the street. And there's crowds following him. They're all up against him. And these two blind men went to holler. Son of David, son of David. It wasn't nothing for Jesus to hear his titles called or, or, or anthems like Hosanna be called, which means save us. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. There was nothing for Jesus to hear these accolades. They were common. But the Bible says he was walking down the street and these two blind men, son of David, they said something next that made him stop. The Bible says when Jesus heard it, he stopped. They said, have mercy on us. And the Bible says that when Jesus heard them call for mercy, he stopped the caravan. He stopped the crowd. Why? Because a cry for mercy had been made. What would make Jesus respond to a request for mercy? He's always seated in it. He is seated in mercy. His position is mercy. What a good God. I'm going to tell you why. It's the only way to liberate us from our past. Do you realize if I go before God in my sin, my history defines my destiny? I got to see. Oh, there it is. If I stand before God today and I am held accountable for my sin, my history now defines my destiny. But because God, who is just, but at the same time merciful, and could not compromise either one, the righteous God, who would not compromise mercy nor justice, said, I will send my son, who will commit no sin, therefore owe no debt, and I will allow my son, sinless, to bear the sin and the judgment and the debt of those that have sinned. And when he dies on that cross, I will turn my back and darkness will cover the earth because I cannot look upon sin that he will bear. And I'll accept the payment of a righteous man who owes me no debt. I'll accept his payment for the one that sinned and did. 
Therefore, the Bible says on that cross that righteousness or justice and, and, and mercy or peace kissed each other. Both were satisfied. On that cross, God, God's justice was satisfied because the debt for sin was paid. But God's mercy was satisfied when Jesus took my place. That is the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that's why it is the only hope for man. It is the only hope to restore man back to God or man back to himself. Without Jesus, without Jesus, brother, brother Jefferson, without Jesus, I ain't got to forgive you. You ain't got to forgive me. Without Jesus, if someone's done you wrong, you say, I'll hate you till I go to my grave. But when I believe in a God, a God that is just and a God that is merciful, a God that's not going to overlook my sin because my neighbor sinned, that no matter what those around me do, I still got an answer for me. I want to show you something heavy here and we're going to close. Are you in Acts 26? I want to show you something. I want you to see it. I'm gonna, we're, going to, we're going to bring verse 18 to light. I'll pray and we'll go eat some chicken. I want us to see this, church. Satan will magnify your offense to God every time. And if you don't know the power of forgiveness, you can't break his hold. <laughs> Satan will hold you out of church. He'll keep you out of the word. He'll keep you from sharing the gospel. He'll keep you out of the will of God if he can just keep magnifying your offense. So in other words, I am strapped to my past through offense. Why? Because offense is a trap. But the power of forgiveness liberates me. That's why, glory to God, that's why David in Psalm 103, who is broken and depressed and downcast, has to remind himself of God's goodness. And in Psalm 103, David says this in back-to-back -back verses, verses 1 and verse 2. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Verse 2, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits and then he lists the first one who forgives all mine iniquity David recognized he was going to stay down he was going to stay discouraged he was going to stay depressed watch this he would stay bound to his past until he received the forgiveness of God that's why the enemy doesn't want you know it what the blood of Jesus paid for you because he wants your history to define your destiny but the blood of Jesus will erase your history like that board right there so you can walk in your divine destiny not being held back by your history I was preaching the righteousness of faith in Dallas, Texas one day. And I had a, a minister walk up to me, older minister. And he said, uh, I got to share an issue I got with your message today. And I just want to help you because I've been doing this a minute. I said, yes, sir. He said, young pastor, you can't be preaching that right there, that righteousness by faith. You can't be preaching that to your church. I said, it's in the Bible. He said, oh, I know it is. I know it is. He said, but you can't preach it. I said, Why? He said, if you show people that they can be made righteous by faith, then they're just going to go and take that and sin with it. They're going to commit sin. You've got to, you've got to preach on sin and holler about sin and deal with sin and bring up every sin, and you've got to lay it out there. He said, because if you, once you show the people what sin is and that they're doing it, that's the only way to get them right. And I said back to him, I said, I hear what you're saying. I said, but Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I said, if I can convince the church that they are low-down, good-for-nothing sinners, then they will walk out the door and have no problem with doing what they were just told they are. But if I can show them that's not who God made them to be, you've been made the righteousness of God by faith, and you can live like Jesus in this world. I am not Hootie James. That's who I was in high school. You might say, I know you know you knew me. I am a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away. My history does not define my destiny. 
You might have been a murderer. You might have been a prostitute. You might have been a gang bear. You might have been a thief. I don't care what you were. That's not who you have to be in Jesus. That is the power of forgiveness. But you got to forgive yourself. You can't let the enemy bring up what you did seven years ago when it's already under the blood. Because all he's trying to do is keep you bound to your past. And the sad thing is, is when I don't forgive those that have wronged me, I bind them to my past. And I bind myself to where that happened. Do you know there are folk in their second marriage that are offended at their spouse, their second marriage spouse, that didn't even commit the offense, but their first husband did? And you've taken the first husband's offense into your new marriage, and then you hollering about, oh, oh, no, you don't. I done been through this. Like, wait, 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 I, what are you talking about? When have I ever done? Oh, no, my first husband did. No, I'm not your first husband. The point is, is that when you have unforgiveness in your heart, it straps you to wherever that happened. You never grow past it. You never get beyond it. That's why the enemy is always pointing us back, always trying to get us to direct our attention at the offense because he knows he'll drag us right back there. We'll never grow. We'll never be who God called us to be if he can keep reminding us of our mess. Increase our faith, Lord. Oh, they got to wrap this up. I hit my Bible and wrinkled it all up. Watch verse 18. Whew. God called Saul, verse 14, made him an apostle, delivered him, verse, eight, verse 17, delivered him from the people to go deliver the people. Because we can't deliver people when we're in bondage to people. That was a word. Not because I said it, but because it's right here in verse 17. He said, before I, you can deliver people, you got to be delivered from people. Delivered people, deliver people. Verse 18. To open their eyes. This is the commission Paul was given by Jesus. Go open their eyes. Turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to God, let's stop right there. That's the assignment. Open eyes, turn from darkness to light, and the power of Satan to God. All that right there, study in light of 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 that says that Satan is the little g-god of this world and that he blinds our minds lest the light of the gospel should shine in and we be saved. So Satan wants to keep us blinded from the truth and the, and, 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 and the darkness of this world. Now watch what he then says verse, in verse 18. Next statement, read it out loud. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. Read that again. That they may receive forgiveness of sins, which means this. When you receive forgiveness of sins, your eyes are open. You go from darkness to light and the power of Satan to God. Take the reciprocal of that. If you take the reciprocal of that, unforgiveness keeps my eyes blinded, keeps me in the dark and under the power of Satan. Did you see that? I didn't come out from under Satan's power. My eyes were not open. I didn't come into the light until I received forgiveness. That's the power of forgiveness. It's why we got to walk in it. It's why we've got to exercise it. It's why we've got to be the advocates of it. Now I'm going to close with this. At Luke chapter 6, let's be it right here. This is, this is to tell us stuff right here. Luke, Luke, 6, Luke 6, let me show you this. And I want to read verse number uh, uh, 36 through 38, and I'm done. But if y'all would give me time. I, 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 I would tell you what mama told us because mama said what Jesus said in verse 31. She said, as you would that men should do to you, do you also unto them likewise. 
do the folk the way you want to be done. Right? So watch verse 36. Be ye merciful. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is what? Merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Here we go. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Now watch verse 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Let me, let me read that in context. Give mercy, and mercy shall be given unto you. Give judgment, and judgment shall be given unto you. Give condemnation, and condemnation shall be given unto you. Give forgiveness, and forgiveness shall be given unto you. But watch this. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, with all it shall be measured unto you again. In other words, I've got to sow what I want to reap. That's why I believe Dr. King said, and these words worth repeating out of many of his quotes. These are worth repeating. He said, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. But the world right now is programming us to hate and to betray and just be mean-spirited and divisive. And we can't win the war like that. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's what the enemy would have us to believe. We are in a spiritual warfare. And it is time for the body of Christ to rise up and step into our call. And our call is to love God and love our neighbor. Our call is, is, is to take the reconciliation that God has given us to him and to take that vertical relationship that we have with God and use it in a horizontal on a way to not only reconcile man back to God, but to reconcile man to man. The whole Bible is fulfilled in two statements. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. It is time for the body of Christ to take what we have received of God, to take the love that he has given us and to share it with a fallen world that is in desperate need of it. Don't you dare name Jesus and praise God and curse a man to your left and to your right. We have been called to walk out out this love and to walk out this mercy to take the reconciliation God has given us and to use that word to reconcile man. That is the commission God has given every one of us. I want to encourage you to love somebody this week. I want to encourage you to just be standing by somebody you don't even know and have a conversation and just talk about whatever. I'm telling you right now, we've got to break the, the, the curse that is on this culture. We have got to rise up in the love of Jesus Christ. The hope of the world is not in a Democrat and it is not in a Republican. The hope of the world is in Jesus Christ. It is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have got to live out this gospel. Do you know that evil comes in all shades and colors and parties and nations and nationalities and backgrounds, rich folk, poor folk, broke folk, educated folk, ignorant folk? Evil shows up in all their faces. And the enemy would have us believe that, that a whole group is evil because of the actions of some. Evil takes on many fronts and many faces. And the hope of evil, the hope of a soul that's been bound to evil is salvation. There's a problem with that man's soul if he hates that man because of the color of his skin. He's got a soul problem. He don't have a skin problem. He's got a soul problem. His problem is way beyond skin deep. It's deep in there. He's got a serious soul problem. If you judge a man by the color of his skin, you have a serious spiritual and soul problem. And the only answer for your broken, corrupt soul is Jesus. When is the world going to realize, when is the church, I can't help the world, I cannot help the world. When is the church going to realize, the church, that's what I'm preaching to, the church. When is the church going to realize, the gospel is the only hope. The gospel. We, we got to preach the gospel. You got folks so bold in so many fronts, but yet Christians stay silent. Let me pray for you. Glory to God. Man, glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. And Lord, if there be anything in our hearts right now that we need to ask forgiveness for, that we need to own that we've done that has offended you or offended others, 
may this be the day that we receive forgiveness. Church, I want you to know that I only have a kingdom agenda. I'm so broken by what's going on in this world. But I can't make this pulpit a soapbox. And you don't need my opinions. Only the truth can make us free. And it's not popular. But go with me to this moment. Is there something in your heart? Is there an unforgiveness? Is there an offense? Is there unowned sin in your own life? that before we look at someone else, we need to take before God. Who are we to judge another of the same sin we commit every day? Who are we to judge somebody else for what lives in our own heart? ask you to give us a conviction if we hold hate in our heart if we hold prejudice in our heart if we judge another in our heart because of the skin he wears we stand guilty for pointing a finger at another when we're guilty of the same exact thing. Is there something in your heart today you just need to ask God to forgive you? Are we guilty of judging the world for what we do? I've seen how ugly racism can be and I've seen it in the church. The church has got to repent. being taken it seems like every week we need revival we need revival we need revival in Shreveport we need we need your move we need your spirit we need churches to rise up and preachers to stand up and Christians to walk in love. Our young people need you, Lord. This system that has kept the poor in poverty, that has kept the poor uneducated and in bondage, must be broken, it must change. for you to save this city. I ask you to save our streets. I ask you to save our nation. 
I ask you to do something, God, that only you can do. Our hope is not in a man. Our hope is not in a movement. Our hope is not in somebody's agenda or organization. Our hope is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let, Lord, you would use us as ministers of your love, as ministers of the gospel, as ministers of forgiveness. Fill us with your spirit. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, forgive me for ever judging another for the same sins I commit. Keep me in remembrance to do as you have said to judge my heart first before I judge another. And though your habitation is justice, I thank you that you're seated in mercy. Have mercy on me and forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with the fruit of your spirit that I would walk in love and use my life to reconcile man to you and man to himself. In Jesus' name, amen.